that's what led us to coming up with this sort of framework of the 10 truths. And these 10 biomarkers offer a sort of window into the health of your cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory system, musculoskeletal system, metabolic health, and psychological well-being. So a window into kind of four key systems of the body. If you are living in a way which is optimizing these 10 biomarkers slash functional tests which we'll get to then the research should suggest you are going to be significantly reducing your risk of developing chronic disease hello hello and welcome to another episode of muscle for life i'm mike matthews thank you for joining me today to learn about the top 10 biomarkers that you can track and you can improve that will help you understand how long and healthy your life is likely to be. And by tracking and working to improve these biomarkers, of course, you can increase your chances of living a longer and healthier life. And as you will learn in this episode, tracking key biomarkers is for everyone, especially as we get older. If you're in your 20s and you are eating well and exercising, you probably don't have to worry about it. But if you're in your 40s and beyond and you are eating well and exercising, it's smart to start watching these biomarkers because for various reasons, genetics being one of them, you can be doing the most important things mostly right most of the time and have one, two, maybe three key biomarkers out of range. And addressing that may require a very specific intervention, specific to you, something that maybe you would do that I wouldn't do or vice versa. For example, your body might do best on a lower carb diet or a lower fat diet or on a very low saturated fat diet for the purpose of keeping your LDL levels down or on a low sodium diet and so on. And if you are a healthy person, if you have a healthy body composition, if you eat well, if you exercise regularly, you probably won't be able to conclusively determine any of those things without consulting key biomarkers. And so you're gonna learn about all of that and more in today's episode. And you are going to be learning mostly from Simon Hill, who is a physiotherapist, a nutrition scientist, fellow podcaster, and fellow author of The Proof is in the Plants. And in this interview, he is going to discuss what he calls his Living Proof Challenge, which is a 12-week program aimed at fostering habits that enhance both physical and mental health, lower the risk of chronic diseases, and help you live a longer life. And as you can guess, that program is designed to improve the underlying physiological systems and processes related to these 10 key biomarkers that Simon is going to discuss in this interview. Before we get started, how many calories should you eat to reach your fitness goals faster? What about your macros? What types of food should you eat? And how many meals should you eat every day? Well, I created a free 60-second diet quiz that'll answer those questions for you and others, including how much alcohol you should drink, whether you should eat more fatty fish to get enough omega-3 fatty acids, what supplements are worth taking and why, and more. To take the quiz and get your free personalized diet plan, go to muscleforlife.show slash diet quiz, muscleforlife.show slash diet quiz now, answer the questions, and learn what you need to do in the kitchen to lose fat, build muscle, and get healthy. Simon, thank you for taking some time out of your busy day to, to talk with me and talk with the listeners. Thanks for having me, Mike. This one certainly has been a, a little while in the making, so grateful to be here with you guys. Yeah, I appreciate it. So today's discussion is going to be about health. And so you have written about and you, you've spoken about 10 truths, as you refer to them, or 10 biomarkers that you believe are the most critical predictors of longevity. And that's what I wanted to get you on the podcast to talk about. What are these 10 truths? What are these 10 biomarkers? And maybe we should start with just a simple definition of terms, what you mean by those things for people who are not even familiar maybe with what a biomarker is and why do they matter? And I 
don't think we'll have time to have an in-depth discussion about all 10, but maybe you want to take uh, the top three to five or so and get into more detail about why they matter. And then also share with people the best way to track these things, to measure and track them uh, without having to go to great lengths in terms of inconvenience or expense, because we can't all be, as you had mentioned offline, can't all be Brian Johnson. Right. Uh, So the 10 truths are, as you say, they are predictors of health span and longevity. And so at the, the end of last year, I spent a lot of time, Mike, thinking about how do I take all of the information that I've read and learned over the years and that I've received from working with individuals and also 300 plus episodes of information with scientists, academics, and put that into a framework that's really accessible for people um, like you. I'm sure you get you know emails from people just saying, you know, Mike, just tell me what to do. There's so much information out there. So I went away and, and really thought long and hard about how can I create a framework that takes evidence-based information that um, we know is important when it comes to mitigating our risk of chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but also being healthy, fit, and strong and vital in our day-to-day. How can I put that into a meaningful framework that is accessible? And so step one was really thinking about what matters in terms of the things that we can test. So if we're going to be really objective about this, we want to be able to, to understand where our health is at today by testing certain things before intervening and then being able to retest. So test, intervene, retest. That was really the, the framework. And in terms of thinking about, well, what, what tests are actually meaningful? They needed to predict health span and longevity, but they also needed to be things that we can shift the needle on with some evidence-based lifestyle intervention. My focus wasn't on measuring things that we can't actually improve through our lifestyle. And essentially, we had a very long laundry list of different biomarkers and functional tests. And we narrowed this down to 10 different tests. That's what uh, led us to coming up with the, the sort of framework of the 10 truths. And, and these 10 biomarkers offer a, fr- a, a sort of window into the health of your cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory system, musculoskeletal system, metabolic health, and psychological well-being. So a window into kind of four key systems of the body. If you are living in a way which is optimizing these 10 biomarkers slash functional tests, which we'll get to, then the research should suggest you are going to be significantly reducing your risk of developing chronic disease. That is, you are going to live more years without disease. You're compressing the number of years at the end of your life where you are affected by cardiovascular disease, you know, heart attack or stroke, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, dementia, etc. So if we start from from the kind of top down, thinking about the 10 truths as a as a list, the there's three that kind of pertain or inform to the health of the cardiovascular system. They are APOB, blood pressure, and VO2 max. For the musculoskeletal system, grip strength and bone mineral density. For metabolic health, HbA1c, fasting blood glucose, triglycerides, and waist to height ratio. And then for psychological well-being, a scale called the flourishing scale. And what we were able to do is go through the literature and determine for your age and for your gender, what is suboptimal, what is normal, and what is optimal for each of these 10 truths. And so before doing any type of lifestyle intervention, you can really see where your health is today. And we created a calculator where people can put their results in for each of the 10 truths, and then it will score them accordingly, depending if their result is suboptimal, normal, or optimal, and give them a kind of longevity score. And where can people find that? Where is that calculator? So you can get that, you can go to theproof.com. Um, this framework calculator, everything is is freely available, zero cost. We believe that over time, as more and more research comes out, that calculator will be tweaked and it will only get better. Um, but it's a it's a it's a really great starting point to give you a real a, an idea as to how you are faring in each of these four 
key systems of the body. And the reason that that's important is at an individual level, where you focus, Mike, might look different to where a 50-year-old woman focuses. You know, perhaps for you, you score really well on grip strength and bone mineral density, but maybe not so good for APOB. Whereas for someone else, APOB is great, but their grip strength is suboptimal. Now, their lifestyle interventions that are going to shift the needle most are going to be different for you to that person. So what we measure is the same for everyone, but how we intervene and what we focus on more or focus less on is going to come down to our, our individual test results. And that's the kind of way that we, we created this framework just to draw attention to what matters and then give, give people the information so that they can kind of tailor a lifestyle that's going to benefit them most at an individual level. And my internet is struggling a little bit. So if you already said this, I apologize, but just want to inter- interject that uh, these things that, that, that you are talking about are not only important for reducing the risk of disease, and thereby improving longevity, which there's a, a quantitative focus, uh, I suppose you could say reducing risk of disease also has a qualitative component, but it also relates to very much your quality of life, not just how long you're around for, but how well everything is going to work while you're here and your functional age, so to speak, which um, refers to, again, how well are your various physiological systems working uh, relative to norms. So your biological age could be 70, but because you've done a really good job taking care of yourself, your body, functionally speaking, is working at the functional age of maybe 60. Yeah, and I think that's what we want people to focus kind of most on. It's not necessarily about ex- extending life. Right. Because, I mean, uh, medicine medicine has gotten quite good at that, but there's a point where you have to wonder, maybe doesn't get as far as what what am I living for? Uh, but if the quality of, of that time that you have gets, gets below a certain threshold, I'm sure that those thoughts go through the mind of people who are experiencing those types of problems. Certainly. And, and I think it's it's kind of critical to think about where, where the average person's health is at today, Mike. So you know, latest data suggests only 7% of at least U.S. adults would be considered metabolically healthy. And can you, can you explain what that means exactly? Yeah, me- metabolically healthy, um, you know, typically that, that is kind of synonymous with not meeting any of the criteria for metabolic syndrome, which would mean any of the following. So reduced HDL, elevated triglycerides, uh, elevated HbA1c, elevated fasting blood glucose, or increased waist circumference, elevated uh, blood pressure we can put into there. So less than 7% of people have all of those things I just reeled off as what we would say are actually normal or healthy. 93% of the population have one or more of those that are not optimal. And there's you know a significant percentage of them, nearly one in two adults have cardiovascular disease, 30% of adults have non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver disease, about 10 or 12% have type 2 diabetes, 40% have pre-diabetes, and then the rest of people that don't have a diagnosis, Mike, they might think that they're healthy, particularly if they're not doing the tests that we're talking about here, but they're, they're well on the way towards a diagnosis. Yeah, they're just, things just haven't gotten bad enough yet for them to be aware of what is actually going on. Right. And if, if I was to go a, le- a level deeper, uh, you, you asked, what does metabolically healthy mean? You know, I've, I've tried to really define this and, and also in conversations with various guests on my show that research this, get really clear because metabolic health can be a very uh, abstruse kind of vague term <laughs> that, uh, you see people use, using differently. The way that I would define it uh, in a broad sense is that you are able to efficiently convert chemical energy in, in food into mechanical energy, which requires really healthy mitochondria and skeletal muscle tissue. And then at the same time, you are, are storing 
fat where it should be. And what I mean by that is there are different uh, compartments for body fat storage. Subcutaneous, essentially under the skin, visceral and ectopic, which are inside or between the organs. The former, so subcutaneous fat, that is really or relatively benign. It's not the kind of deleterious, harmful fat. When we're thinking about body fat that really wreaks havoc in terms of metabolic health, so it throws out those things like triglycerides and HbA1c and fasting blood glucose, that is body fat that has spilled over and is now inside or between organs, visceral or ectopic fat. And, and so people who are not metabolically healthy are either well a long way down the road with regards to storing fat in organs like the liver and the pancreas, or they're at the early stages of, of that process, which is you know, dictated by how much body fat someone has and, and also their genes. And are there any other factors that can weight someone's fat distribution pattern toward visceral fat, aside from just being too fat and, and, and maybe being genetically predisposed? Yeah, so there, there certainly is a genetic uh, strong element. I think we should under, underscore that. And that's why you might see two people in front of you who are the same body fatness, but one of them is relatively metabolically healthier than the other. And what you'll, what you'll find is that there is this kind of inter individual difference where one person can store more fat subcutaneously. And so that's protecting them because it's not spilling over into the visceral or ectopic fat depots. Whereas the next person, because of their genes, they are storing much less fat subcutaneously. So at the same level of body fatness, they have a lot more fat building up in the liver and pancreas. Um, now, outside of genes, yes, and this is a, an area of debate and ongoing research. But there are, you know, for example, we know that post-menopause, there are some significant changes in, in hormone status, particularly a, a big drop in estrogen. And body fat distribution changes a lot during this time. You know, and women start to store much more fat around the abdomen. And they'll you know, often experience an increase in visceral fat. That might be somewhat mediated by changes to hormone status. Then there's other research, and this is a little hard to tease out, looking at sleep deprivation. So if you uh, take someone, Mike, who usually sleeps eight or nine hours a night, and you force them to only sleep four hours a night. And then you look at their food behavior and where they're storing body fat in the weeks to come. And you see an, an increase in calorie consumption. You see this um, kind of gravitation towards ultra-processed, hyper-palatable foods in a sleep-deprived state. And you see a shift in terms of where fat is stored. Some of that is mediated by the calorie surplus, but some of it seems to be independent of that. So something's happen happening during that sleep deprivation state that is changing the uh, internal physiology environment in a way that leads to those excess calories being preferentially stored in between or inside organs and having more of a damaging effect on metabolic health. So there's kind of, I guess, two potential examples outside of genetics that can influence body fat um, distribution. And uh, two, two comments on those things. One is with the hormonal shift that occurs in women as they get older and how that can change the fat distribution, that can be confusing. I've heard from many women over the years who are confused because what they experience is that they are seeing now more fat accumulation around their midsection. And that's that's different than when they were younger, when the uh, excess fat or, or just body fat in general, if they were to notice expansion or even contraction, it would typically be lower down uh, hips, thighs, butt. And the confusion is also uh, around their body composition in that their weight isn't changing, but now what they're seeing in the mirror, they are less happy with and they feel like they look fatter. And uh, so just wanted to comment for, for any female listeners to understand that it's there's a, a distribution pattern of the body fat that you have and that can change, which can change the way that your body looks, 
without changing your body composition. You don't necessarily have to gain more body fat and you are not necessarily gaining body fat, even though it looks like you are in the mirror because you can see what's happening with your stomach, for example, and you don't see what's happening on the backside of your body. And so just wanted to quickly comment on that for for female listeners who are experiencing that or who may experience that in the future just so they can understand. And there's some there's some speculation as to why why body fat distribution uh, changes for women from premenopause to postmenopause. Yeah, it's it could be hormonal driven, but from an evolutionary point of view, like if you look at women early in life, they they before menopause, they have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease compared to men. And one of the hypotheses that may explain that is that before menopause, like you said, they tend to store fat more around hips, thighs, butt, which is the less kind of metabolically damaging place to store fat. Whereas men at the same age tend to store more fat viscerally for a given body fat level. Yeah, yeah. Or just midsection in general, right? Right. And then the, the evolutionary kind of explanation for that might be that it's not ideal to, for a woman to store a lot of fat around her abdomen if she needs the space for a growing baby. So it may have something to do with the you know development of a fetus, being pregnant, procreation. But it seems that that change in fat distribution at least partly explains why once women get to you know 50, 51 and into postmenopause, there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease that's observed at the same time as uh, fat dis- distribution changes. Yeah, which, which for people listening, uh, you would expect as visceral fat accumulates, that, that's basically what happens to everyone, right? Yeah, and this can be explained. So as, as the liver particularly, when, when the liver starts to build up with fat, you develop insulin resistance at the side of the liver. And insulin, its job at the liver is really to turn off glucose production. Because the liver produces glucose, particularly when we're in a fasted state, to ensure the blood glucose doesn't drop too low when we're sleeping, for example, overnight. And insulin's role is to kind of you know, help turn that tap off if blood glucose is getting too high. When fat is building up in the liver, you get insulin resistance at, at the liver. So insulin's not working as well. You can't shut down that glucose production as well. So you get more glucose going into circulation. Um, At the same time, you tend to get increased export of of fat, triglycerides, out of the liver. And that gets packed, that has to get packaged up because fat, fat, unlike glucose, is not water soluble. So glucose can just kind of freely flow through blood. Whereas fat has to to be kind of chaperoned by a protein. And and that's why we have lipoproteins. People have heard of like LDL, low density lipoprotein. That essentially is just a way for us to take fats, triglycerides, which are an energy substrate and, and get them to tissues. We put them, package them onto a protein. And so when you start to develop this fatty liver, you tend to get increased export of these fats into the blood uh, on these lipoproteins. So you get an elevation in low-density uh, lipoprotein. More broadly, what we would describe as ApoB, which I mentioned earlier, was one of the, the 10 truths and is a, probably the best single biomarker for predicting your risk of cardiovascular disease. And th- this is why you know, we often like to put these things in buckets, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but they're all very much related. Really, most people with poor metabolic health, type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they're dying of cardiovascular disease eventually. Yeah, I want to get to the cardiovascular biomarkers in particular. I think those are those are worth uh, talking a bit more about. However, first, I wanted to follow up with a question. The second thing I wanted to ask you um, was uh, on this point of undersleeping and accumulating visceral fat. Assuming there is a connection there, um, I mean, if if you're only sleeping four hours a night, you're going to have many other problems that that practically speaking, there probably aren't many people out there who only sleep on average four hours per night. Um, However, there are many people who sleep probably six, six and a half hours, which can be enough for maybe a 
small segment of people who are genetically lucky. Uh, but for most people, that is, it's, it's not undersleeping so severely that, that it, it would be considered a major deficiency, but it's, a, it's an insufficiency. Would you expect that chronically undersleeping, just being chronically sleep insufficient would have maybe not as severe effects in terms of influencing visceral fat accumulation, but might have effects nonetheless, might, uh, again, just derange our physiology to a degree that actually matters in terms of visceral fat, not to mention ba- many other elements of our physiology that, that suffer when we don't get enough sleep. But Yeah, we, we're kind of having to uh, extrapolate from a very short-term study here to you know, what does this mean long-term and if the sleep deprivation isn't, if the magnitude of, of kind of deprivation isn't as great, but it's, it's something that's happening for months and years, is, it, is that having an effect and then is it compounding? Um, I think we could hypothesize that you're right. Um, certainly, we, we have, uh, if we zoom out, we have data that shows, you know, if you're sleeping less than six to seven hours a night, you have increased total mortality, so premature death. Same thing is if you're sleeping more than nine hours a night, so you, there's this kind of sweet spot tends to be around seven to eight hours a night. And then um, either side of that, you see increased risk of cardiometabolic disease and uh, premature death. Is that explained by changes to fat distribution? It could be. I don't have a concrete answer on that, but it, it may well be, or at least partly explained by that. One of the many reasons to get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, and I think people... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a few kind of very simple things to think about in your life that can help you get better sleep. And, you know, I appreciate we've got a lot to get through. Um, so I won't go too deep here, but what does your eating window look like? And when are you distributing your calories throughout the day? This is somewhat dependent on, on someone's goals, but if sleep is an issue, I think there is an argument to be having more of your calories in the earlier and middle part of the day rather than late. And then a regular bedtime, something we can easily overlook, but our circadian rhythms and our sleep quality, you know, generally we do better if we're going to bed at a similar time and waking up at a similar time uh, each each night and day. And thinking about light exposure, at nighttime, you know, for many of us, we're still staring at bright screens or we're in rooms with bright lights on. And you just have to appreciate that when you're doing that, you might be sitting in Los Angeles and it's 9 p.m., but your body thinks you're in Australia in the middle of the day. So, of course, when you just quickly run up to bed and, and jump in bed, it's going to be difficult to get to sleep. And, um, some of that is, is explained by the way that light affects hormone production and you can get disruption of these circadian rhythms, which are really critical for both falling to sleep and then having good sleep quality throughout the night. And uh, something that I've seen that can be insidious, and I've experienced it myself to some degree, is we establish uh, certain habits when we're younger and we get used to following that routine generally, and it doesn't seem to negatively impact our sleep. So that might include watching TV at night, being around bright lights in general, doing more active things at night, or at least in the in the maybe early evening period, and for a while not having any sleep issues. And so there are no issues. And then though at some point it changes, and it's typically as we get older, and not realizing that our physiology has changed now and our, our habits are, are no longer uh, sufficient for sleeping well. But there, there can be this window of time when somebody is thinking, well, it wasn't that long ago when I wasn't having any problems with sleeping and I, and I wasn't paying attention to any of these things. And so it must, it must not be those things. Yeah, like a lot of things in life, it's easy to kind of take take our health and uh, for granted particularly in our 20s um and we we feel we feel invincible and then you know as time goes on 
I didn't realize what I had when I could just sleep perfectly, basically always six and a half, seven hours, you know, blackout unconscious, wake up before my alarm. Yeah, as time goes on, we, we kind of get away with far less and have to be much more intentional. If you like what I'm doing here on the podcast and elsewhere, then you will probably like my award-winning fitness books for men and women of all ages and abilities, which have sold over 2 million copies, have received over 15,000 four and five star reviews on Amazon, and which have helped tens of thousands of people build their best body ever. Now, a caveat, my books and programs cannot give you a lean and toned Hollywood body in 30 days, and they are not full of dubious diet and exercise hacks and shortcuts for gaining lean muscle and melting belly fat faster than a sneeze in a cyclone, but they will show you exactly how to eat and exercise to lose up to 35 pounds of fat or more if you need to lose more or want to lose more and gain eye-catching amounts of muscle definition and strength. And even better, you will learn how to do those things without having to live in the gym, give up all of the foods or drinks that you love, or do long, grueling workouts that you hate. And with my books and programs, you will do that. You will transform your physique faster than you probably think is possible, or I will give you your money back. If you are unsatisfied with any of my books or programs, the results, anything, for whatever reason, just let me know and you will get a full refund on the spot. Now, I do have several books and programs, including Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, and Muscle for Life. And to help you understand which one is right for you, it's pretty simple. If you are a guy aged 18 to, let's say, 40 to 45, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger is the book and program for you. If you are a gal, same age range, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger is going to be for you. And if you are a guy or gal, 40 to maybe 45 plus, muscle for life is for you. I want to now come back to the cardiovascular components of these truths, these biomarkers, because they are some of the most important ones, uh, I I would think, on the list, uh, because we need a, a healthy, a highly functional cardiovascular system to live a long life and, and to, to live a long, good life, to have energy, I mean, even starting, you mentioned mitochondrial health, starting there at a cellular level to have energy to do the things that we want to do, especially as we get older and we want to do things like play sports with grandkids. And uh, a lot of people listening are probably doing a fair amount of resistance training. A lot of people listening are also doing cardio, uh, but a lot of people listening may not appreciate the importance, and that might be a consequence of age. A lot of people might be younger and they are more focused on improving their body composition. They want to do it in a healthy way, but they haven't begun to think about VO2 max, for example, and how important it is to maintain a high VO2 max, especially as we get older. Uh, Can you talk a bit more about, again, these cardiovascular components of these 10 truths and what they are, why they matter, and how we can work? to optimize them? Right, and I, I, I kind of uh, missed at the beginning when I was explaining that the 10 truths are these windows into these kind of four systems. If we move psychological well-being to the side for the moment, cardiovascular disease or cardio, cardiorespiratory system, really here I'm talking about how do we protect our arteries? When, I, when I'm talking about metabolic health, I'm talking about how do we Largely, how do we protect the liver and musculoskeletal skeletal system? How do we protect the bones and muscle? So you've asked me here about you know, cardiovascular disease. Really, if we want to avoid having a heart attack or a stroke or even experiencing conditions like vascular dementia, there's a large vascular component to many forms of dementia, but certainly vascular dementia, then we need to protect our arteries. And so the three of the 10 truths pertaining to the cardiovascular system um, that we've included. Essentially, if you optimize these, then you are going to be doing, you're going, you're going to be doing as, as best as you can, you're going to be reducing your risk of damaging your arteries day in, day out. And so these were ApoB, blood pressure, 
and VO2 max. ApoB, if someone's hearing this for the very first time, earlier I mentioned low density lipoprotein and that lipoproteins carry fats through circulation. Low density lipoprotein is one type of ApoB containing lipoprotein, but there are others. So there is IDL and VLDL. And just like low density lipoprotein, all of those are what we would describe as atherogenic. In lay terms, what that means is they have the capacity to kind of crash into the artery wall and get stuck or retained and then kickstart an inflammatory process in the artery wall, which leads to the accumulation of plaque and you know, after decades, a cardiovascular event like a heart attack or a stroke. When we measure ApoB, we get the summation of LDL plus IDL plus VLDL. And while LDL cholesterol generally tracks with ApoB, they don't always. So it is now considered broadly that ApoB is a better predictor of cardiovascular disease risk of atherosclerosis, which is the building up of the plaque. So if someone can, can order that and measure it, that is going to be superior than ordering LDL cholesterol. And can you talk a bit more on that point? Because although I don't think it should be a matter of controversy, given the weight of the evidence, it is. And uh, that is the controversy over the claims around low-density lipoproteins and cardiovascular disease. Of course, now we have people on social media with big followings, a lot of influence, saying there is no such relationship, it's, it's completely fake. I, I would guess some of these people are saying it's actually the opposite, that you want to maximize your LDL levels because, of course, uh, contrarian marketing works and helps you sell things to people who don't know any better. Uh, but can you talk a bit more about that for people listening who maybe are, are confused now because for so long they had heard what you just said, uh, but now in the last few years, they've been hearing sometimes fairly credentialed people, well-spoken people, people who seem like experts say that, oh yeah, that, that, that was old science. Now we know that the truth is, is otherwise, that uh, L LDL, uh, these smaller lipoproteins, they're, they're actually not a problem. And the problem is something else. The problem is sugar or the problem is vegetables or whatever. Yeah, usually, usually, Mike, a, a false dichotomy is created. You know, the problem is sugar, or the problem is insulin resistance, and th that's a straw man argument because both elevated ApoB can be a problem at, at the same time as insulin resistance and eating a lot of refined sugars can be a problem. And so, you can have a, a single biomarker that is causal and necessary for developing atherosclerosis, like ApoB, and it is absolutely true. You can compound it, and basically throw gasoline onto a fire by adding insulin resistance, uh, a diet high in refined carbohydrates, high blood pressure, etc. But you're just stacking risk factors on top of one another. So of course, you would expect that person's risk of cardiovascular disease to be greater. But what is ground zero in terms of atherosclerosis building up at the plaque? You have to have an increase in these ApoB containing lipoproteins in the first place. If, if ApoB is at what's called physiologic levels, so 60 milligrams per deciliter or lower, particularly if it's like 40 milligrams per deciliter or lower, you do not see atherosclerosis. It just doesn't happen. Okay, so people need to appreciate that kind of first and foremost. And what is the body of literature that makes us so confident that ApoB increases risk of coronary heart disease? It's not that we're just looking at one type of study, and it's not that we're looking at animal data. It began in animals 100 years ago, starting off in, in rabbits and then in mice and then in primates. But since then, there's been large observational research, you know, cohorts with hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world where you see an association, elevated levels of ApoB, higher risk of coronary heart disease. Okay, well, that's just observational. Maybe there are other factors at play here. It's not a controlled trial. Well, we also have genetic data, you know, basically nature's randomized controlled trial. There are people at birth who have genetic mutations that give them either elevated ApoB or reduced ApoB to different levels. And when you chart those out, their risk of coronary heart disease is determined by their 
level of ApoB reduction or increase the magnitude of that. And it's a linear relationship. Okay, what about randomized controlled trials? Well, what about if we take people that have heart disease and we put them on a drug that lowers ApoB? We track them for five, six, seven years. Now, this isn't as long as the genetic data. It's not as long as the observational data because it's a clinical trial. But what do we see in five or six years? We see reduced total mortality. We see reduced events. Is the risk reduction in those clinical trials as great as, as if someone wins the genetic lottery and has the same uh, ApoB but achieved from birth as, as what the drug achieved? No. Why? Well, lifetime exposure matters. And that's, you know, in recent years, scientists have uh, kind of popularized this idea of cholesterol years, which is very similar to pack years when it comes to smoking. So you're looking at what is your average, average cholesterol across your lifetime will determine your, uh, the kind of atherosclerosis burden, the amount of plaque that's built up throughout their life. Moral of the story, if you get ApoB down to a physiologic level, you will not be laying down plaque in your day-to-day. When you go to bed at night, you're not going to be laying down plaque. So I think it's a sensible thing to optimize that. And in me saying that, I'm not saying insulin resistance is not a problem. I'm not saying refined sugars are not a problem. All of those can be uh, a problem and contributory to poor health at at the same time. One other pushback that often occurs, Mike, and I'm not sure if you've heard this, people say, well, it can't be healthy lowering ApoB or LDL cholesterol because Cholesterol is very important for the synthesis of hormones. It's very important for cell membrane fluidity. I'm not sure if you've, if you've ever heard people say that. Yeah, and in connection with that, again, some people go as far as saying that, therefore, it's, it's a vital nutrient that you just want to get as much as you practically can of. Yeah, so this, this is a misunderstanding of, of basic physiology. I'll do my best to explain this. Firstly. All cells throughout the body and also uh, astrocytes, neurons, have the capacity to produce all of the cholesterol that they need. All cells throughout the body have the capacity to produce all of the cholesterol that they need. They do not need dietary cholesterol or saturated fat to do that. So why is there cholesterol in lipoproteins, someone might ask? You know, what's, what's cholesterol doing in circulation if it's not being carried to cells if cells don't need it because they produce all the cholesterol that they need? It's a great question. It's a question that I asked Dr. Thomas Dayspring on my show. I did seven hours with him on lipids. He's a lipidologist. And really, cholesterol is only in these lipoproteins to create a spherical structure. So before I mentioned that fats can't, they're not, they're not water soluble, so they have to be carried by a protein. Essentially, that protein is like the outer layer of a beach ball. And then inside is where the cholesterol and the triglycerides are. And it's the cholesterol which, which gives that lipoprotein a spherical shape and allows you to pack triglycerides into it. So the lipoprotein, the purpose of it is to get these triglycerides and energy substrate to tissues, not to carry cholesterol to tissues. So not only do we, do we understand the, the physiology there, but we also have studies looking at people who are put on severe lipid lowering drugs they, that get them down to 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter do they produce an optimal ma- amount of hormones yes they do what about people with genetically low ldl cholesterol so again we're talking about cholesterol in circulation are their cells still operating normally are they able to produce enough hormones yes so this idea that low serum cholesterol impairs hormone production I understand the kind of logical leap if someone's not across the physiology, but when you look at the physiology and you look at clinical trials looking at subjects with low serum cholesterol, then it becomes clear that that is more myth than science. Can you address the related claim that by eating a a significant amount of dietary fat it's usually saturated fat is what's being pushed that you can improve your hormonal profile because i've seen some people they might grant you that and say okay fine you don't have to eat a eat a lot of dietary fat and dietary cholesterol but if you do your hormones going to be better i would challenge someone to send us a study that 
shows independent of calories, you can improve hormone production by consuming saturated fat over, say, unsaturated fat. I do believe there are studies out there showing when you add fat to someone's diet, you can improve hormone production. Um, and in those studies, it seems that you're taking someone from a kind of hypocaloric state to hyper. And we know that calories can certainly affect hormone status, hormone production. But I'm yet to see any evidence that suggests that saturated fat, independent of calories, is superior to any other macronutrient um, type for assisting the body with hormone production. That said, also a low total fat diet can also, I think, be a problem for hormone production, but it would have to be very low. It would have to be you know, below 10% of total calories, which not many people are, are getting anywhere close to. Yeah, it's almost impossible. You have to be a dedicated bodybuilder really to even make that work. <laughs> and so so coming back to APOB then, what are some practical things that people can do to reduce their or to uh, maybe slow the accumulation of their cholesterol years, so to speak? Yeah, so some of this is going to to come down to individual genes, but let me just just begin this kind of broadly at a population level. Different types of fat affect the liver's ability to clear ApoB containing lipoproteins from circulation. So there is, you know, what's known as an LDL receptor on the liver, and that receptor just imagine it as a gate. It's kind of a gate that can open or close, and when it's open, the LDLs, the IDLs, and the VLDLs, which I mentioned, are all ApoB containing lipoproteins that can cause atherosclerosis. They can get back into the liver. So bringing ApoB down in circulation. Saturated fats tend to downregulate the LDL receptor gene expression, which means when you're eating a diet that's higher in saturated fats, and we can double click on that if you want because not all saturated fats are, are the same, but just broadly speaking, those saturated fats tend to sort of close that gate a little bit, which means less of the ApoB containing lipoproteins can be cleared from circulation. They build up. You have a higher ApoB when you perform this blood test. Whereas if you swap calories from saturated fats for unsaturated fats, particularly for polyunsaturated fats, you see a lowering in ApoB. And, and polyunsaturated fats have the opposite effect on the LDL receptor. They upregulate gene expression. They open the gate. So here I'm talking about you know reducing foods in the, in the diet like butter, very fatty cuts of red and, and white meat, and instead, eating either lean cuts of red or white meat, or better again, fatty fish, which is really rich in polyunsaturated fats, um, tempeh, tofu, nuts and seeds, all rich in these polyunsaturated fats. That kind of food substitution will generally result in a significant reduction in ApoB. And then from a cooking uh, oil kind of perspective, swapping butter or ghee or coconut oil or palm oil out, you know, for something like olive oil. And you should probably also at least briefly touch on seed oils and how the the weight of the evidence is 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 basically the opposite of the uh, general message that that you find on social media. Not that you have to uh, intentionally add these to your diet. Uh, if, if you if your diet is rich in seed oils, of course, some people that's just because their diet sucks and they eat a lot of highly refined, hyper palatable foods. It's not because they are cooking their lean cuts of meat in canola oil or something. Right. So there's this uh, really critical point here where we need to make sure we're not conflating seed oils with hyperpalatable ultra processed foods that can contain seed oils but also contain a lot of artificial ingredients refined sugars high sodium low protein low water etc so when you independently look at seed oils you're right we don't see that they are inflammatory they don't seem to be in in human studies we don't see that they're uh, obesogenic in fact, we see that populations who consume more linoleic acid and have higher linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, um, it's the most abundant polyunsaturated fat found in seed oils. Populations who have higher adipose tissue levels of linoleic acid and serum levels actually have lower risk of cardiometabolic disease and total uh, mortality. 
So I think that the fear mongering is is clearly um, not warranted. And I would argue personally, the the majority of cardiometabolic disease burden is a result of you know 50 60 percent of total calories maybe a little more being from ultra processed foods which are hyper palatable easy to over consume they're driving the obesity epidemic we've spoken about the problem with having excess body fat particularly visceral fat already and how that influences cardiometabolic health but i would throw it back to anyone who wants to blame seed oils for chronic disease i believe if you went out to the food environment and got all of those ultra processed, totally delicious, yummy foods and swap the seed oil out and just add butter in, I don't think it makes a single difference to chronic disease incidence at all. It it may it may get worse with butter, which I, I want to follow up on the point that you had mentioned regarding certain saturated fats being different than others. And uh butter, I know, is is one that, as you mentioned, if if you are uh, wanting to get down into the details of of optimizing these different physiological systems. It's not that you should never have butter, but you don't want to be consuming large amounts of butter. Can you talk a bit more about that and and then also the difference between certain saturated fats and others? Yeah, I think I might walk back what I said before a little bit. I think you're right. It it's if you swapped these seed oils in these ultra processed foods for butter you're right it might not make much of a difference or it could in fact worsen outcomes so what's the what's the issue with butter and why does butter associate with disease differently to other dairy fats like um, cheese and yogurt some of this has to do with the food matrix particularly in this dairy conversation so it's not just the amount of saturated fats or the type of saturated fats it's also the foods in which we consume them which affect how they are digested absorbed and utilized and therefore their impact on apoB and in dairy foods there is what's known as a, a milk fat globule and that when it's intact so in more kind of whole forms of dairy foods like yogurt and cheese so less refined forms that milk fat globule is intact and it actually affects the amount of fat that is absorbed when you eat those foods. And therefore, you see a much, a much uh, smaller increase in ApoB relative to a dairy food like butter, even for the same grams of saturated fat. Because in, in butter, because of that refining process, you break the milk fat globule. And you kind of liberate those saturated fats such that they now have a much more profound impact on blood lipids. Um, so that's one of the kind of important things to keep in mind with butter. It is refined. And in that process, you make those saturated fats kind of much worse from a cardiovascular disease risk point of view. And what about ghee? Because that's, that's often re- presented as the less refined, more uh, esoteric <laughs> butter. Yeah, from the studies that, that I've saying ghee will still raise LDL cholesterol. The saturated fat profile is a little different to butter, I believe. It's not something that I've, I've honestly deep dived. I've looked at coconut oil, which is a different saturated fat profile to butter. So for the same grams of saturated fat, it still elevates LDL cholesterol, but not as much as butter does. This kind of point on the type of saturated fat being also important here just at a very high level, there are short chain fatty acids, which are people may have heard when um, learning about the microbiome. Those are saturated fats. There's medium chain fatty acids, which were popularized uh, by the low carb keto kind of community not so long ago. Um, And then there's uh, long chain fatty acids. And within each of these different types of saturated fat kind of families, there are different types, again, depending on the length of that chain. The most deleterious when it comes to ApoB are these long chain fatty acids, particularly myristic uh, and palmitic and, and lauric acid, those three, which are predominantly found in tropical oils, so coconut and palm oil, butter, which we've mentioned, and then in fatty cuts of meat, so red meat and 
and white meat. There is another long chain fatty acid called steric acid, which seems to be relatively neutral. It doesn't seem to have that same effect on the LDL receptor. It doesn't seem to increase ApoB like these other saturated fats. And that uh, is the predominant saturated fat that's found in chocolate. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that uh, because, I mean, it's it's a, a dietary recommendation that, that I've made for a long time is to just be conscious of your of your butter and of your coconut oil, which I don't know how popular that is now for, for a bit there. It was pretty popular. A lot of people, I had heard from, from many people who were eating a lot of coconut oil because, again, they thought that it, it, that was a healthy thing to do. So they were trying to work it into various meals, um, maybe even replacing olive oil, for example, with coconut oil. Just wanted to make sure that the people listening got that information. And before we wrap up, I wanted to also talk about VO2 max and if we have time, blood pressure as well. Um, and maybe starting with VO2 max, what is that and why does it matter? And uh, what can we do to improve it? And what can we do to, to maintain it, especially as we get older? Because it is a lot easier, I mean, similar to gaining muscle and to getting strong and, and retaining that muscle and retaining that strength. It's, it's a lot easier to do when we're in somewhere, let's say in the first half of our lives than it is in the, in the second half. Not that you can't, but if, if you're in the first half of your life and you have the time and you have the inclination, you're going to be happy <laughs> if you start now on both of those things, on your, on your muscles and on your strength as well as your VO2 max. Uh, you're going to be happy in the second half of your life if you start in the first half. Right. So VO2 max is it's an incredible predictor of total mortality, premature death. In fact, a couple of studies that have looked at this recently, it's a, it's a better predictor than is having cardiovascular disease or having type 2 diabetes. And in some of these cohorts where they kind of track people over eight to 10 years and at the beginning look at their cardiorespiratory fitness, um, which is you know, pretty synonymous with VO2 max. Uh, what you see is people who have you know, a, a, a high or elite VO2 max have a, you know, four or five times less likely to, to die during that follow-up period of eight to 10 years. And so this really speaks to the health of their central cardiovascular system, so heart, large arteries, how efficiently they can pump oxygenated blood through the body and then be able to utilize that. The core definition is you know, the maximum amount of um, oxygen that you can pump through the body uh, in milliliters per kilogram per minute. And as I said, this is largely dependent on central cardiovascular health. In terms of optimizing this in your life, the, the biggest kind of levers that you can pull are going to be your different modalities of cardiovascular training, you know, quote unquote cardio. In particular, that high intensity you know, interval type training where you're getting up to 90% of max heart rate, which is working extremely hard. If you haven't done that before, I think a lot of people kind of underappreciate how hard that is. But you don't have to, to be exercising at that intensity for a very long period to reap some, some pretty considerable rewards. Whereas if you're wanting to improve your VO2 max by doing more moderate intensity cardiovascular training, then you need to go for much longer. And there's often this great debate uh, I'm not sure if you've covered this on your show about what's better, high intensity interval training, moderate intensity cardiovascular training. Um, you know, and maybe if we're thinking about bang for buck, time invested, HIT is better, but it doesn't necessarily suit everyone. Um, it kind of depends on their baseline um, cardiorespiratory fitness, their balance, you know, how likely are they to have falls, how confident are they. So this is going to look a little different for everyone. I think a good cardio program ideally includes both exercising at a moderate intensity for the majority of your minutes you're doing across a week, but then also supplementing that with some high intensity work. And in doing the two of those, you're targeting both 
both the peripheral cardiovascular system, uh, also the skeletal muscle and mitochondria that we spoke about earlier. And then you're also hitting that kind of more central cardiovascular system and getting heart and large arteries to adapt in a way where you can now pump oxygenated blood around the body more efficiently. And how does strength training fit into this context? Because there are at least a few people listening who are probably pretty good about their strength training. They don't do much cardio. Aside from walking, maybe they get in their 10,000 steps a day, but they don't do any or, or they do very few cardio workouts properly. You know, I think a good all-round program is is getting you know, 120 to 150 minutes a week of kind of moderate intensity cardio. Um, that could be on a stationary bike. It could be rucking or hiking. You know, there's a there's a lot of conversations around zone two and measuring your heart rate and and all of these things. And it just depends on who you are and what your goals are. I think f- for the for the average person who's just focusing on longevity, get out and do a, 150 minutes of exercise cardio a week where you are breaking a sweat. You can probably still have a, a conversation, but you're a little bit puffy. Um, you can probably still breathe through your nose, but maybe for some people you can't, but you're, you're not extremely exhausted. You can, you can do that type of cardio for 45 minutes, you know, relatively easy. So the intensity of that is going to be affected by your baseline cardiorespiratory fitness. For one person, that might be a jog. And for the other person, that is a walk for the person who is relatively less fit. So 150 minutes of that per week. Uh, I usually recommend that on top of walking. Regardless of the of what you're doing for strength training. Because I'll, there are many people who, who uh, maybe would like to believe, have heard and would like to believe that strength training, as long as you're doing a few hours per week, that, that's enough. That's enough for your cardiovascular health. Uh, especially if you lift the weights fast, that's your cardio. I think it's a different stimulus. You know, you might look at your using, you might have a whoop or you're measuring your heart rate with something and you might uh, look at your resistance training session and see that across the 60 minutes you were in zone two for the majority of it. But it's a different stimulus. You have to appreciate that you're lifting a weight and then you're resting for two minutes. It's different to continuous exercise over a 60 minute period. So I would treat them as a completely different stimulus. So stimulus is what's going to cause the body to adapt. Your resistance training is primarily a stimulus that's going to stimulate bone to grow stronger, lay down more bone, increase your bone mineral density, to be able to tolerate more force so you don't experience a fracture or you're less likely to. And then it also stimulates tendon and muscle to adapt so that you can be stronger under load. The cardio, that moderate intensity cardio that I'm talking about, I like to think of that as more of a, uh, a stimulus that targets kind of the periphery. So all of the smaller arteries that are going into muscle tissue, the muscle tissue and mitochondria it's itself. So we are essentially creating a micro stress that causes that part of our body to kind of update and grow more resilient to be at less risk of disease affecting those that aspect of our physiology. And then the high intensity, so you, let's say you have two or three resistance training sessions a week and you can split that up so you're kind of covering your whole body over the week. You have 150 minutes of this moderate cardio. I put that on top of walking because most people when they're walking are – in zone one, or um, it's not enough of a stimulus to get those systems I was just talking about to adapt. And then adding in some of that high intensity work, which really is, you know, let's call it, let's call it 20 to 30 minutes of time invested once a week. And that's because you need to warm up um, and there's rest periods. But that's the time where you're stimulating the kind of more central cardiovascular system, particularly the heart. And so that all-round program, you're, you're providing three different uh, stimuli that are you know, all kind of leading to their own really important benefits in terms of your uh, health span and frailty. Makes sense. And let's talk quickly about blood pressure before we wrap up as well. And why is that on the list? And how does it, how does it relate to 
It's going to relate to obviously some of the other things you've already talked about. Yeah, this is like a relatively unsexy biomarker, and I'm not sure why. You know, 55% of adults in the U.S. have hypertension. You can get a uh, a blood pressure cuff either for your arm or your wrist on Amazon for about forty dollars that are relatively accurate. So I think it's something that that more people should be measuring routinely. For every 20 millimeters of mercury increase in your systolic blood pressure, you double your risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's there's quite a few mechanisms. You know, high blood pressure probably makes our arteries uh, more stiff, so they're kind of less supple, and also damages the actual endothelial cells that can make them more susceptible to those ApoB-containing lipoproteins to kind of penetrating and getting stuck. So earlier I mentioned that ApoB really matters. It's ground zero, but you can stack risk factors. Well, having high blood pressure is one of those. So if you have high ApoB and then you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, you're, you're now creating you know, th- this perfect environment to be laying down plaque, which is you know, certainly what we see. The great news is there are quite a few lifestyle kind of interventions, things that you can do that will greatly lower your blood pressure. All of the exercise that we've just spoken about will, will do that. Acutely, exercise raises blood pressure, but chronically, it lowers it, just to note that. And then the other kind of levers that you can pull are weight loss. So if someone is overweight, um, every one kilogram above your ideal body weight adds about one millimeter of mercury to your systolic blood pressure. So if you're 10 kilograms above your ideal weight, that adds about 10 millimeters of mercury to your blood pressure. So weight loss can be something that a lever that people can can pull to lower their blood pressure. But independent of calories and body weight, the types of food you're eating also have a considerable effect. And I'm not sure if you've heard of the DASH diet before. Yep. I've recommended it to my father-in-law who has blood pressure issues. And I think he's kind of following it. I, I, I basically remind him every time I see him because his blood pressure is too high and I'm trying to be a good guy. <laughs> yeah. So this is a dietary pattern. Uh, you know, broadly, it's low saturated fat. It's high fiber. It's very plant rich. It is high potassium. It's low sodium. You know, it's going to have an emphasis on, you know, white meat and fatty fish, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and low-fat dairy. Yeah, I mean, it's an all-around great diet. If somebody is getting most of their calories from relatively unprocessed, nutritious foods, that that's basically how they're eating. Of course, though, with the special emphasis on sodium, which means that maybe if you're going to follow that diet, you're not going to use as much salt as you might like to use, or you might get a potassium chloride instead or something. But Exactly. Yeah. The potassium, um, the low salt potassium chloride salts can be a great option for someone who is at high risk of cardiovascular disease or has high blood pressure for sure. Interestingly, like the biggest reduction in sodium for most people is removing ultra processed foods. So like 80% of the average person's salt intake in Western countries, it's not actually from the salt shaker. So like that, that is important, particularly if someone's already done all of the whole food swaps and they still are wanting to lower their blood pressure more. But just by simply going to whole foods and, and trying to eat less of these ultra processed foods, most people will dramatically lower their sodium intake, which is amazing. And potassium will generally go up, particularly if you're eating a lot more uh, fruits and vegetables, and also dairy. Dairy contains potassium, which might be one of the reasons why dairy foods tend to be associated with lower uh, blood pressure. But potassium has the opposite effect to sodium on blood pressure. So yeah, those are a couple of things that people can kind of uh, focus on if they want to lower their blood pressure through lifestyles, weight loss, and then thinking about the the dietary pattern that they're consuming. And one other question regarding ApoB and VO2 max. Um, people some people may be thinking, uh, well, should I be measuring these things or should I just do the types of things that Simon's talking about and, uh, and, and just hope that they are sufficient and working well? And if you would recommend measuring, what are practical ways of doing that? Blood pressure is easy enough. Like you said, you buy it on Amazon, it comes and you just, you just strap it on, wait a minute, get your reading, you're done. 
Yeah, we're, we're kind of glossing over a lot of this. I, I will add that in the Living Proof Challenge PDF, which you can get at theproof.com, it goes over all of the 10 truths, how to measure them, how to intervene on them in detail. As again, that's zero cost. But yeah, I think people should measure them. And, and I think so for, for a few reasons. One is it's hard to optimize the things that you don't measure. So remember at the beginning, I said, you might focus on different uh, lifestyle interventions than, than I might. And that's going to be based on our results. So it's going to give you more specificity. Everyone's time poor. We're all time poor. We're all busy. I want you to know it where you as an individual should be focusing most. What's going to really make the biggest difference for your health span? That's what measuring enables you to do. Most of these tests are very accessible in that they are free or very cheap. Um, or in the case where there is potentially a considerable cost and it's inaccessible for some people like a VO2 max kind of gold standard lab test, which could be, you know, depending where you live in the world between $100 and $300. Well, you can actually perform what's called a beep or shuttle test. Have you ever, Did you ever do those at school between the two cones? Uh, maybe. I, I, it's the, the, it seems to, to ring a, a distant bell, but... So long story short, there's this uh, test that many people listening at school probably did it where you're running between two cones and there's a beep. You have to make it to the next cone before the beep. And then the, the, the time between the beeps is progressively getting shorter and shorter, thus that you are running faster and faster. If you miss the cone, because the beep occurs before you get there, you, you have to make the next cone or you're out. You cannot miss two cones in a row. When you miss two cones in a row, you end up with, you know, something like level nine shuttle three, whatever it was that you were up to, because it, it, the, the recording is also along the way telling you what level and shuttle you're up to. There's a, a, a few studies now that have looked at how well does this correlate to VO2 max, and it actually correlates amazingly well. So you, you can, and I have a table in that PDF, you can do the shuttle test on a basketball court. Say you get level nine, shuttle three on the table. You just go to male or female uh, and then your age, and it will tell you what that uh, equates to from a VO2 max point of view. So now you've, you've got your VO2 max as a kind of approximation with, with a high level of confidence for nothing. So that's what we've tried to do to make these things you know, more accessible. But certainly I think that there is huge benefit in testing as many of these things as you can so you know where to focus. And then uh, the second reason is I think it's re it can be really inspiring and motivational for people. So a lot of the time we're going through life and, and we have no idea what's going on on the inside. Remember before I said 7% of adults are metabolically healthy and there's a huge percentage of people that don't have a diagnosis but they're not metabolically healthy? Well, once they actually measure and they can see on paper, shit, I'm not doing so well here on this marker that's important for cardiovascular disease, on this marker that's important for metabolic health, they can be more motivated to kind of buy into some of these new lifestyle habits that we're hoping that they build. And then see the improvements in actual, let's say it's blood work versus hoping that things are getting better because something could be improving significantly that you're not aware of. You, you still feel the same, but you are reaping considerable fruits. You're just not aware of it consciously. And we're still pulling together the data, but we've now had like over 20,000 people kind of go through the Living Proof Challenge. And so we have an enormous body of data where we have baseline results for the 10 truths and then post challenge results and i can tell you because this is a question i often get like how how long does it take to to change some of these things it depends on the biomarker like apob you can change your apob in a couple of weeks with dietary change really in days often uh, whereas something like bone mineral density or strength i'm sure you could appreciate takes a little bit longer but where we're seeing people take four, five of these markers from suboptimal into normal or optimal over a 12-week period. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. And installing those those habits that will serve people for the rest of their lives because it's really it's really about building a healthy lifestyle uh, as opposed to uh, doing some short term intervention, which is fine in some cases, but the the biggest benefits, especially with health and longevity, of course, are going to be in the things that that we do consistently, whether good or bad. Yeah. So don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Right? We don't want people to be perfect at this for twelve weeks and then just go back to their old lifestyle. Get it seventy to eighty percent right. It doesn't mean you have to get it right every day or all the time. But do it for longer, do it for decades, as you say. It's going to be, you know, have a much more significant impact on your health than any kind of two or four week type um, challenge. And that, of course, is how fitness, how training works as well. You just, you just want to be good enough most of the time. That's, that's, that's enough. <laughs> well, this was, uh, this was a, a great discussion. We got through uh, mostly everything that, that I wanted to ask. And before we sign off here, why don't we let people know? Obviously, they can. Uh, they can find more material over at theproof.com, right? Yeah, theproof.com. And from there, you can access the podcast. You can download the Living Proof Challenge. Uh, you can find the YouTube channel. You can connect with me or The Proof uh, on on social media. Great. And that was my next question is where people can find you on social media. And that would be The Proof on you're on x uh, as well as other networks yeah so it's the proof on x it is uh, at simon hill on instagram and there's also uh, at the proof on instagram where we just upload the the podcast episodes that come out each week awesome well this was a great discussion simon i, I appreciate you taking the time again thank you thank you mike thanks for having me appreciate it how would you like to know a little secret that will help you get into the best shape of your life? Here it is. The business model for my VIP coaching service sucks. Boom, mic drop. And what in the fiddly frack am I talking about? Well, while most coaching businesses try to keep their clients around for as long as possible, I take a different approach. You see, my team and I, we don't just help you build your best body ever. I mean, we do that. We figure out your calories and macros, and we create custom diet and training plans based on your goals and your circumstances, and we make adjustments depending on how your body responds, and we help you ingrain the right eating and exercise habits so you can develop a healthy and a sustainable relationship with food and training, and more, but then there's the kicker. Because once you are thrilled with your results, we ask you to fire us. Seriously, you've heard the phrase, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Well, that summarizes how my one-on-one -on -one coaching service works. And that's why it doesn't make nearly as much coin as it could, but I'm okay with that because my mission is not to just help you gain muscle and lose fat. It's to give you the tools and to give you the know-how that you need to forge ahead in your fitness without me. So dig this, when you sign up for my coaching, we don't just take you by the hand and walk you through the entire process of building a body you can be proud of. We also teach you the all important whys behind the hows, the key principles, and the key techniques you need to understand to become your own coach. And the best part, it only takes 90 days. So instead of going it alone this year, why not try something different? Head over to muscleforlife.show slash VIP. That is muscleforlife.show slash VIP and schedule your free consultation call now. And let's see if my one-on-one -on -one coaching service is right for you. Well, I hope you liked this episode. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, subscribe to the show because it makes sure that you don't miss new episodes. And it also helps me because it increases the rankings of the show a little bit, which of course then makes it a little bit more easily found by other people who may like it just as much as you. And if you didn't like something about this episode or about the show in general, or if you have 
uh, ideas or suggestions or just feedback to share, shoot me an email, mike at muscleforlife.com, musclefor.life.com, and let me know what I could do better or just uh, what your thoughts are about maybe what you'd like to see me do in the future. I read everything myself. I'm always looking for new ideas and constructive feedback. So thanks again for listening to this episode, and I hope to hear from you soon.